audiobook. The World of the American Pitbull Terrier by Richard Stratton Chapter 4 More Fisherman Stories Believe it or not, I regularly receive a steady stream of correspondence from all over the world, praising my books, I am personable enough to take pleasure in any generous praise of my books, feeding my ego, and making me feel that I have made a difference. Right thing for the dogs I love writing the books. There are, unfortunately, times when I had my doubts about this. A substantial number of the senders and people I talk to say that their favorite part of the books has been the chapters in which I relate stories I've heard about the individuality of the breeds. Apparently, the nature and personality of the dog shines through more in the stories than throughout my pontifications in other sections of the book. Well, I like stories, too, and I'm happy to introduce a few more. There may be fisherman stories, and they certainly sound that way, especially to someone who doesn't know these dogs all that well, but, unbeliever by nature as I am, I am inclined to believe them. A point of view. One of the many annoyances that American pit bull terrier owners must put up with is the people who inevitably knock on their door, wanting to borrow their dog. Since no one in their right mind will let their dog get involved in a fight without being there to supervise and separate the dog, this means borrowing both the owner and the dog. Usually the situation is that a certain dog has been either threatening the neighborhood or biting children, and an irresponsible owner is completely undisciplined about controlling his pet. Your friend doesn't want the responsibility of owning a bulldog, but he would certainly like to take advantage of him just for the occasion. In almost all cases, it is best to be polite but firmly decline to use your dog. Very little good can happen, and a lot of bad is always a possibility. But the flesh is weak, and so is the mind, consequently, most of us have succumbed to the desires of a good friend on at least one occasion. This happened to Maury Rootberg when Booger, father of Going Light Barney, was eight years old. It seems that an arrogant member of the upper class used to take his Chesapeake Bay Retriever out to an empty lot on the outskirts of town to exercise him. If a stray dog passed by, a break was given for him to mistreat or kill. The Unfortunate Animal Unlike other hound owners, this person felt very proud of his dog's fighting skills. Strangely enough, one of today's Chesapeake ancestors was reputed to have never lost a duck, or a fight. This giant dog is rumored to have killed a number of dogs, both small and large, and victims' owners tried to convince Maury to take Booger out into the field and let him loose. To Maury's credit he resisted the idea for a while, but as the record of mutilations increased, he finally relented. Accompanied by two of the other dog owners, Maury took Booger out to the lot, and sure enough, there was the owner of the Chesapeake with his boots, hat, whistle, and whip, working on his dog. Maury slowed his car to a stop and opened the door. Booger had already seen his victim. It was later noted that Booger's only injuries were the raw soles of his feet which he made by quickly getting out of the car to attack the victim as quickly as possible. Like a guided missile, Booger shot in front of Chesapeake, but he was so silent that it was only at the last minute that the big dog became aware of his approach. The cheese peak turned with delight, opened its mouth to snatch the impudent, if reckless, visitor. Booger flew straight into those huge gaping jaws, as if he were going straight down the throat. Booger impetuously threw himself under his massive opponent and out of sight. The Chesapeake's head moved down as Booger slid under him. Now, from the Chesapeake owner's point of view, some small dog was stupid enough to go straight to destruction. 
The owner was unable to hide his pride and satisfaction. The huge rust-colored body hid Booger. Completely. No sound came from the two dogs, and Chesapeake's head, apparently holding its opponent, occasionally shook or rotated. The owner walked over to Mori, tapping his whip with satisfaction. Sir, he said, you just lost your dog. Saying nothing, Mori studied the situation for a few more moments. Then he walked over and looked under the retriever. There was Booger, all four paws hugged against the giant body that loomed over him. He was gripping that massive jaw and pulling it so wide open that the Chesapeake couldn't make a sound. Eyes shining, Booger shook his prey for a few seconds, causing his head to move from side to side. Blood from the retriever's mouth was dripping from its mouth down the sides of Booger's head. Look down from here, Maury said quietly. It's amazing what a different perspective can do to a person's point of view. Suddenly, the owner of the Chesapeake, who had been so prim and arrogantly happy before, was now apoplectic, threatening and ordering Maury to get his killer away from his dog. And this was one of those rare instances when it was worth the hustle and bustle to pit a bulldog against another breed. The owner of the Chesapeake got a taste of what it was like to be on the other side of a pet being abused. He lost his pride in his dog's fighting ability and, perhaps, gained a little compassion. And his dog never again attacked other dogs, regardless of size. Maybe he's had enough of fights. More likely, he got scared running after another dog like Booger. The fighting dog lover and the dog lover. Not all dog breeders are angels, of course, but I have been blessed to know some of the most decent and honorable ones, and they compare favorably in dog knowledge and compassion with any breeder. Of course, Wallace was primarily concerned with the perpetuation of the dog lineage and would only occasionally breed a dog to test the value of his breed against others. However, he referred to himself as a lover of dogfighting, and he lived in a time when a person could be somewhat more open about the activities of an arena dog than they are today. In his youth and middle age, Wallace was an enthusiastic bird hunter, and one of his hunting companions was the county judge. Indeed, they often used the judge's dog, a pointer, on their raids. Occasionally, conversations would revolve around the bulldogs and inevitably evoke the same response from the judge, Bob, I just don't understand how you can put those dogs into a fight. I'm a lover of them, I can't understand such a thing. There is nothing I love more than a dog. Bob, without the gift of infinite patience, would swallow his anger and try to explain the arena dog competition that even a dog lover can participate in, but not a practitioner. Like so many other people, the judge's mind was not open to new or different ideas. Despite false criticism from the judge, the friendship between the two men endured and they remained hunting companions. One day the judge showed up with a new hunting dog, and naturally Bob asked about the old one. Oh, old Jack was getting too old to hunt, so I gave him away. When Bob asked who had kept the dog, the judge replied that he didn't know the person's name, it was just someone he had met on the street. This inflamed Wallace considerably, but at least for a while, he said nothing. However, the next time his friend started babbling about Bob taking his dogs to fight and as a dog lover himself couldn't understand it, Wallace exploded. Yes, you are a dog lover, fine. Said Wallace in a voice that shook the trees. His natural voice was low anyway low in pitch and unintentionally ominous. Here Jack spent all these years valiantly working his hardest for you, 
at your signal and call, and slave to your whims. And how do you repay him in exchange for that love? When he grows old to hunt beyond your expectations, you discard him like an old shoe. And you haven't even bothered to find him a good home. No, you just gave it to some stranger, and you have no idea what kind of treatment he's getting. Well, if that's what being a dog lover is, I'm glad I'm a sponsor of fighting dogs. Perplexed was the judge at Wallace's reproach that he had spent many weeks trying to locate his old dog. And he never said anything about Bob being a fighting dog sponsor again. Jocko and Lion One of my all-time favorite stories was the one told to me by two businessmen in Boulder, Colorado, when I was about 14 years old and just couldn't help but hear enough about the American Pit Bull Terrier. One of the two men owned a restaurant called Howard Steakhouse, and he had been a professional boxer in his youth. His career has recorded only two losses, both by points decision, one was a welterweight world title fight and the other was a welterweight crown. The other man owned a lot of property, including a tea and coffee company that I later worked for. My greatest pleasure was getting these two together and listening to them tell stories of dogs from the past. I've mentioned Jocko before. He was a small piebald dog weighing 14 kilos, small but indestructible and hard as a rock. At the time of this story, Jocko was in the possession of Ed, the property owner, who kept him on a stake with a cable mounted in his luxurious home. Later, Lion was brought into Jocko's domain, a large pit bulldog weighing 30 kilos with a color that gave rise to his name. His physique was also that of a lion, with his large head and strong neck, not to mention his enormous size. Lion was attached to a chain mounted about 200 feet away from Jocko, who was casually looking around to find a way to free himself so he could pummel this impetuous newcomer. You see, Jocko was like most bulldogs in that he felt he could beat anything regardless of size, even a lion. Only in Jocko's case, you weren't sure if he could. Well, Jocko never found a way to break free of the chain, but he was occasionally taken inside the house, and that's where he somehow made his escape. Nobody was sure what happened. He was left alone in a room on the third floor and the door was securely locked. The seventeen-year-old daughter was the one who discovered that Jocko had escaped the room. She also noticed, terrified, that the window was open. Surely the dog wouldn't have enough intelligence to jump out the window from that height. In Jocko's case you never knew, of course, and the girl looked down at the grass, expecting to see a broken body. Anything. In that time, Ed joined his daughter and he learned of Jocko's disappearance. He, too, looked down confused. No broken piebald bodies on the floor. There was a tree outside the window, but there was no dog in it. Yet, Ed wondered, could it be possible that the dog jumped onto the tree branch, then climbed a branch onto the roof? Once on the roof, the dog could merely follow the slope and descend to the porch roof, and from there jump to the ground safely. Well, if Jocko made it to the ground, he probably went straight after Lion. That way, he could just as well have jumped from the three floors, as his death would just as well have been inevitable. When Ed and his daughter reached the backyard, they stopped involuntarily in great surprise. There was Lion, with his chain wrapped around him like a cocoon, being dragged around by Jocko who had him by the muzzle and completely helpless, with the help of the chain. Jocko looked at them and wagged his tail as he gave the lion's huge head another twist, then a shake. Jocko, as usual, was without a scratch. Jocko strikes again. In hindsight, 
It's hard to separate the wheat from the chaff in the stories I hear about Jocko. Some of them just seemed impossible. The same people who told the stories about Jocko had stories about Denver, Lion, and other dogs that seemed more believable, but they increased the most eloquent and laughed as hard as they could when they talked about Jocko. Apparently, he was something special, an absolute dynamo, smart, playful, talented, full of personality, and utterly devoid of conscience. He had a real penchant for causing trouble for his owners and getting them into trouble. An example of this was the time Ed began letting his 14-year-old son Jimmy take Jocko for walks. Things went well for a while, but one day an Airedale Terrier managed to get within range of Jocko who unceremoniously caught its muzzle like a bear trap. The Terrier's screams could be heard in the distance, and Jimmy was having a hard time getting Jocko free. A mob soon formed, and each person had their own system for breaking up a dogfight. Water was thrown over the dogs, a match was lit under Jocko's tail, and a firecracker was lit under the dogs, all to no avail, as Jocko held on tight, and the terrier's screams rose to a crescendo. Finally, the terrier managed to escape and disappeared, running towards the horizon. Now this little episode created a lot of talk in town, because Airedale Terriers were considered tough dogs, and one being attacked by a dog half his size became a small-town topic of worthwhile conversation. Unfortunately, Ed, as a businessman, didn't want to talk, so he had a muzzle made for Jocko which he wore from that day forward during walks with Jimmy. Things went well for a while afterwards, and Jocko enjoyed the rides even though he had to put up with the muzzle. But one day a giant stray, apparently descended from the Terra Nova, took the whale's appearance the wrong way and unceremoniously pounced on him. The giant dog caught its opponent helpless and almost suffocated. Of course, Jocko was completely at ease. So what if he was gagged? He was exactly happy to be in a fight. Grabbing what he could of his opponent's body with his powerful forepaws, he pushed the muzzle across his neck. The most he could take were the little bites, a bit of skin and a tuft of hair, but he held on tight and worked that small grip with all the enthusiasm he would have if he was actually accomplishing something. The big dog, meanwhile, was losing some of his enthusiasm after about five minutes of throwing his best punches at the helpless little dog, only to have Jocko exulting in all he had given and begging for more. When the big dog's confidence gave way, his tail went between his legs. He walked away a little, undecided on what to do, and in doing so, Jocko hugged him tighter with his front paws and buried his head with the muzzle around his neck, looking at everyone as if he were whispering in his ear, perhaps telling him what he was about to do. With him. The giant beast turned and ran through the city as fast as it could, with its small muzzled opponent in hot pursuit. You can imagine how that looked in the eyes of the townspeople. Here Jocko two months earlier had beaten a bully Airedale Terrier twice his size, now he's obviously spanked a dog three times his size, and he's done it with a muzzle. Half an hour later, Ed, quietly working in the store, was surprised when a customer entered the store exclaiming, Ed, you'll never believe what I just saw on the street. Dusty and the German Shepherd Readers may remember Dusty from my first book appearing in the Fancy Stories section, and a photograph of him appeared in the second book. It belonged to a man I referred to as, Pete the Plaster. In this story, Pete recorded Dusty to get some idea of his courage, as it was his desire to breed the dog, as he was very fond of him. Well, if there's anything cruel about dogfighting, it's the recovery period later on, and poor old Dusty was really hurt. 
It was the day after the fight, it was freezing cold outside, the ground was covered in snow, and poor old Dusty could barely walk. Peter would normally put Dusty on a leash before taking him out for a walk, as it was customary in those days for people to let their dogs loose, but what was the need to put a leash on poor Dusty who was in such a state of pity he could hardly walk? When they left, Pete and Dusty proceeded at a snail's pace up the steps to the backyard. Each step was a bigger obstacle for Dusty who had his injured front leg raised and was staggering on his back too. Finally, Pete carefully picked Dusty up and carried him down the steps. So intent was Pete on putting his dog gently down that he didn't notice the German shepherd in the alley behind the coal ash. But Dusty saw. As soon as his paws hit the ground, he rocketed straight towards the strange dog who had the nerve to be alive and breathing, and on his land, too. Now, Dusty was a small dog, and Shepard was an unusually large dog. The big dog got up and, as a result, batted Dusty away like he was a fly. Pete stepped back to see the small dog fall in front of him, the same small dog that only a moment before was too stiff and sore to move. But as soon as Pete reached out to grab Dusty, his arm slammed into the air, because Dusty got his paws back and lunged at the shepherd. This time he managed to penetrate the thick fur just behind the ear, but the big dog shook him out and again sent him somersaulting towards Pete. Dusty was back in a second and, simulating a head attack, he grabbed a front paw. The small dog blurred as he shook off his prey, and the big dog roared in anger and pain. At this point Pete could see the need for a sturdy pole and hurried to get one. When he returned, he found that Dusty had placed the big dog on its back. Grabbing him by the ear, Dusty dragged the shepherd in a circle. When Pete released Dusty with the pole, it was his opponent twice his size who limped away. Pete put the leash on Dusty, who continued to do somersaults like a puppy. Having taken care of business, he then ran up the steps he had to carry five minutes earlier. Moral, never trust a bulldog not to fight, regardless of its condition. Babe and the Lawnmower Biologists have noticed that the more intelligent the animals are, the more likely they are to participate in play activities. Thus, while the most primitive of animals are basically an eating and breeding mechanism, with whatever reserve time to spend on free time, for example sleeping, the most efficient and intelligent of animals are more likely to be given over to play. Indeed, the greatest advances in Homo sapiens wealth come as a byproduct of play, because science originally was strictly recreational and certainly not treated with respect simply as an intrusion into experiment to satisfy mere idle curiosity. Well, anyway, it's certainly true that play is anything but unknown in invertebrates, fish, amphibians, but in birds and mammals, particularly the latter, we begin to notice increased incidence of play activity, especially in the species generally considered to be intelligent. And, most assuredly, dogs are an example of playful and intelligent animals. Some individuals, including one of the most well-known dog trainers, will dispute the idea that dogs are intelligent, in fact, they think it's an abuse of the term when applied to any animal other than humans. Well, maybe so, but ethnologists, those scientists who have studied animal behavior to the utmost, have no qualms about referring to even some of the lowest animals as being relatively intelligent. I think it is possible to go to extremes in two directions. For example, the general public attributes dogs an almost human intelligence and motivation, whereas, contrary to certain trainers, after years of experience, 
they may think of dogs as merely automatons guided by inherited instincts and whatever training has been imposed on them by humans. Of most ethnologists. Now, if pit bulldogs are extraordinarily intelligent dogs, a concept my observations tend to support. AR, so she follows that they might be more inclined to banter. And, sure enough, they seem to be. Not only are they more playful than most dogs, but they are also more serious about their play, almost as bad as humans in this respect. That is, they will go to great lengths to invent pranks and will pursue them with extraordinary vigor. Give a puppy a stick to pick up and play with, and as he grows up, he picks up logs. A pit bull puppy might start out playing with bicycle tires and end up throwing truck tires. Some examples will help to illustrate the objective further. Many years ago, a man took his pit bull puppy out to sea for a swim. As Norton, the pup, grew up, his frequent trips to the sea and his enthusiasm for him enabled him to become an excellent swimmer, unsurpassed even in water dog competitions that I saw in action. When Norton was grown, he was an absolute wonder to behold on the coast. He will jump into the sea, bite the white foam of the waves, and will soon pass the break line. Then, just to change the course of the fun, he'll splash around restlessly as if he's looking for sharks to catch. I don't know how long he was able to stay there, but his owner always had to call him. I stared at him one day for forty-five minutes, his head a mere speck in the distant waters, as I talked with his owner. When Norton was finally called, his swimming speed was impressive, and leaping over the crest of the wave, he reached the shore exhausted. As most pit bull devotees will guess, Norton would catch anything you were able to throw. My own pet dog will provide another example of how a pit bull becomes completely attractive in play. In her case, she took a step forward in playing with the ball. Since no one had the patience or strength to toss the ball to her for as long as she would like, she had long since learned to play lone ball. The game consisted of squeezing the ball very hard between her paws until it bounced across the room. She would then wait a moment to see if someone would pick it up and throw it back to her or not. If not, she would quickly catch the ball herself. Another game she invented was her own version of the steal the bacon game. She leaves the ball conspicuously in the room and retreats halfway down the hall and lies down, all the while keeping an eye on the ball and for us suspiciously. If nobody makes a move for the ball, it retreats further down the hall to give us one more chance. If someone makes a move for the ball, she charges for it and usually wins the race. She has developed so many variations to her ball game that they are numerous and very complex. To count them. In a word, pit bulls are toy dogs and will often surprise their owners with what they can do. Many pit bulls are seduced by mechanisms that move and or make noises. Thus, lawn mowers, electric or manual, are often the object of a pit bull's attention. My old Wallace's bad red was a dog attracted to lawn mowers. I had to chain it close to a side wall while I used the mower. I once got really close to it with a push mower, and red grabbed one of the wheels, lifted the heavy trimmer completely off the ground, and put it down with such force that it broke one of the iron wheels. And I almost had to use a stick to get the cutter away from him. In the same vein is the tale of the Peterbilt broodmare, Babe. As Babe's owner pointed out when he told me his story, most people who aren't familiar with these dogs are in awe of their capabilities. The incident took place at the time when Perry, Babe's owner, was renting a house and some properties. 
His dogs were tethered to cables with pulleys and wheel axles in a lot adjacent to the house. The lot owner was talking to Perry about using his new tractor-type lawn mower to cut the tall grass on the lot, and he wanted to know if he could safely work around the dogs. Perry assured that none of his dogs would bite anyone and only asked that the lawnmower be handled with care to avoid the engine causing any damage to them, skipping rocks or branches and so on. Convinced enough, Perry found out about a week later that the entire lot had been changed and cleaned. He noticed, however, that there was an area close to Babe that was poorly mown, but since the owner of the land was known to drink quite a bit, Perry attributed it to that. Later when he saw the man complimented him on his fine work. And he says. But that black bitch over there nearly took my leg off. I was just mowing around the area next to her, and the next thing I know she grabbed the mower by the rear wheel and dragged it towards her sideways. An engine weighing 200 kilos and my weight on top of that, and the little bitch dragging us aside. I was lucky to get out alive. Perry sweated to explain that Babe was after the lawnmower and not him. Fortunately, the driver of the lawnmower was able to pull off some dexterous maneuvers and get out of the dog's reach. Not to mention what she would have done to the lawnmower. The dog in the tree and the cat in the alley. Earlier I referred to the fact that there is a higher percentage of dogs that climb trees in our breed than in others. Some time ago in my city, an expert in martial arts and bodybuilding caught pit bull fever. Since he owned a gym, he influenced a number of other karate fighters and weight lifters and thus there was a huge contingent of them who had pit bulldogs and one of them ended up with a tree climber. If you've never owned a tree climber, they're a little difficult to handle. Somehow it doesn't seem right to see a dog up there in a tree. This dog, Chip, seemed to climb trees simply because he had a better view. Chip was kept in a yard surrounded by tall wooden fences, and he was certainly curious about what lay behind them. The first time Bill, Chip's owner, saw the dog in the tree, he was blown away. He was even more astonished to see the dog right at the top of the biggest tree in the yard. Chip apparently figured it was time for Bill to get home from work, so he climbed to the top of the tree to see over the house when Bill arrived. The only problem was, Bill was so stunned to see Chip so tall, he almost drove the car into the garage door. Although Bill eventually got used to seeing the animal in the tree all the time, visitors and neighbors alike had a hard time believing it with their own eyes. One of the branches of the huge tree swayed over the alley, and Chip used it to control the cats that loitered there among the garbage cans. We can only imagine the reaction of several cats to discovering a malevolent-eyed dog looking down at them from a tree branch twenty feet above them. One afternoon, however, Bill was talking to a friend in the alley when their conversation was interrupted by a high-pitched screech from a cat. A few feet away from them, there stood a cat, its tiger fur bristling, as it looked with defiance and terror at Chip on the branch high above. Well, said Bill's friend, I never thought I'd see a pit bull in trouble over a kitten. This world is a comedy for those who think, a tragedy for those who feel. Horace Walpole This world is a comedy for those who think, a tragedy for those who feel. Horace Walpole This was the fourth part of the audiobook. The World of the American Pit Bull Terrier by Richard Stratton. My name is Rodolfo Luis, and I invite everyone to enjoy the knowledge of this wonderful breed. Subscribe so you don't miss the next video. God bless you all. I went.